Welcome to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Breaking through the political noise, separating fact from fiction. From the San Joaquin Valley, the breadbasket of the solar system. Here is your host, Devin Nunes. Welcome back to the Devin Nunes Podcast. Uh, this is John Solomon Week. We're celebrating not only John's great work at Just the News, but also his new book. It's rightfully named Fallout. When I first uh, saw the name John, it made me think of it made me think of a James Bond movie. And in some ways, <laughs> uh, it, you can some make a movie like out that. of this. Because, but you know, everything in this is actually true. And there's kind of three separate uh, investigations that you do throughout this book and Fallout. I have the I have the ebook. I still want my signed copy. It's uh, coming. And you can go to and you can go to justthenews.com and you can get a signed copy of, of Fallout. Uh, John, congratulations! It's doing well. It's one of the it's one of the top sellers, one of the best Thank sellers. Uh, so so walk us through. I didn't even have I had no idea you were even writing a book. I don't even know how you had time to write a book because all the great investigative work that you did on the Russia hoax and helping to expose that for the American people. The American people owe you a debt of gratitude. You and Sarah you. Carter, Greg Jarrett, and Hannity, and all the all the wonderful work that you guys did. Yes. Uh, and here you go. You're doing all this other investigating. I don't even know how you juggle all these balls because these are issues, a few of these issues, I wasn't even familiar uh, uh, with. So walk us back to the beginning of how did you determine that you were gonna write this book, Fallout? When did it start and what? Did, and you started to dig? Walk us through that process. You know so much of the Russia story, uh, Congressman, as you know, because you were such a big part of exposing so much of the wrongdoing, is episodic. You get a, a, a revelation here, a revelation there, weeks go by. And so it's sort of a disjointed story, the way it was delivered by the bureaucracy who withheld documents from us for a long time. And so I want to step back one last time and put it all together chronologically and try to answer the what I thought was the fundamental question that was still unanswered when in December of last year when I wrote this book. I basically wrote this book in two weeks over the Christmas holidays with an amazing author, Seamus Bruner, one of the greatest researchers, works for Peter Schweitzer, amazing journalist. And we just sat down and we sat out to answer this question. Uh, of all the things Hillary Clinton could have used against Donald Trump, why Russia? Why did she use Russia? I mean, it's a weird, it's kind of a weird thing to make an election issue. Yeah. And we found our answer through interviews and then a great document discovery that uh, Seamus Bruner made. In the summer of 2015, Hillary commi uh, Clinton commissioned a secret poll. And what she wanted to know is of all the liabilities in her career, Whitewater, Rose Law Firm, Billing Records, Vince Foster, um, Benghazi, the email scandal, what was the biggest impediment between her and an election to the White House? And to their surprise, it wasn't all the things we just mentioned, which are probably more famous. It was the belief grown out of Peter Schweitzer's book, Clinton Cash, that the Clintons had cashed in on the failed Russia policy, the Russia reboot of the Obama-Biden Clinton years. Uh, and they had gotten $500,000 a speech check, millions of dollars to their foundation. John Podesta's on a clean energy company. It suddenly gets a Russian investment. There's a significant body of evidence of Democrats involved directly in the Russia reboot uh, cashing in. And 53% of the people in that poll that Hillary Clinton Commission said that was the thing that would most likely make them unwilling to vote for Hillary Clinton. So they set out on an opposition research project long before they knew anyone knew that Donald Trump was going to be the uh, nominee to find dirt that would neutralize the Russia issue, to scare the Republicans off. Don't go there. And uh, that was their goal. And it just spun into this amazing event. You know, Donald Trump gets the presidency, hires Paul Manafort. Manafort's got some uh, issues in Ukraine. They hire Christopher Steele. He walks it into the FBI. And before you know it, what started as a political neutralization uh, a strategy became a political dirty trick. And, and that was one of the biggest questions I thought we answered in the book. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really, if you go back to, to that time frame, it, it sure does look, I always say, whatever they accuse you of doing, they're actually the ones doing it. And the Rejection. irony that they would that they would accuse the Trump campaign of colluding with Russians when they themselves were oh, colluding yeah. with Russians. I mean, you can't say that enough times. I just wish we could reach more of the American people. Uh, and that's you know obviously one of my growing concerns we talk a lot about on this podcast is just how so many Americans have no access uh, to real news and real facts. Um, you know, and this book will be buried by the mainstream by the mainstream media. It will. They haven't even taken the time to investigate this, largely mm -hmm. like we talked about on Tuesday, uh, because that that they were part of it. They were part of the Russia hoax. They were they were taking these dossiers from from Fusion GPS. Uh, but 
John, I think you're, it was one of the things that, that the House Republicans on the Intelligence Committee, we were also looking at this too, like what on earth was this? And it looked like it was some research. So I agree, I, I, I wasn't aware of that, of that poll that's in your, in, that's in your book. Uh, but when you move forward, it appears like when they're when as Lee Smith uncovered in his book, The Plot Against the President. Yeah, that's a great book. The the proto dossiers, and the proto dossiers originally it looks like what they're trying to do is they're trying to to link Trump to these Russian oligarchs and to Russian mafia, and the irony of that is is that likely all of this cash that was coming into the Clinton Foundation. Um, and through all of these projects with the reset, like you said, if you look at that, likely a lot of that money was coming from who? Russian oligarchs, oligarchs. with ties to the to the to the Russian uh, mafia. No doubt so, about it. So congratulations on 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 uncovering that. But that's not all that's in this book. So take us to the next uh, component of the book and, and the next big discovery that you find. Yeah, going back to our conversation on Tuesday, I think one of the most important things we created a timeline, looking at every time the investigation came to a stop point where it should have stopped because the evidence wasn't there and they should have shut things down. Instead of doing that, uh, they would leak to the media. The bad guys would leak to the media to keep the story and, and give an injection. I'll just name a couple that are pretty remarkable when people think about this. Uh, it was around uh, January 4th because of the good work you've done in getting the classified documents. The FBI concluded there was no case against Michael Flynn. January 4th, a, of, January 4th of 2017, right? That's right. Thank you for great. This has been going on for so long, John. We have to make sure we always bring the listener and the to audience the year. back yeah. to, to the year because it's the true. scandal just keeps going. It, it, it just never stops. So anyway, sorry to interrupt, but January uh, 4th of 2017. 4th. Yeah, January 4th, uh, the FBI writes a memo to close out the case. There's no derogatory information, no criminality, no counterintelligence threat posed by Michael Flynn. Let's close it down. And then within a week, there's a leak to the Washington Post of those uh, classified intercepts of Flynn talking to the Russian ambassador. By the way, a conversation that was not illegal by in, by any right. means. Right. At the same time, January 7th. Well, and even, even the FBI knew that. Uh, even Comey yeah. knew that. We know now from a lot of the work you and others have done and things that have been uncovered by Judicial Watch that, that even Comey and all the FBI were saying, ah, it doesn't look like there's anything here. And that's right. one of the, the questions that I think we, that still remains. I don't even know if, if the U.S. Attorney John Durham will be able to get to the bottom of it. But somehow somebody lights a fuse and convinces uh, the FBI uh, to, to, to take something that they knew was, was not wrong, was not illegal. And quite frankly, it was quite typical of people within an administration dealing with foreign uh, governments, you know, from our allies to our adversaries. Uh, every transition team does it. Every campaign does it. It's why people in Washington, D.C. and every capital across the globe, it's why we have uh, you know, people who specialize in foreign affairs, whether it's the U.S. Right. State Department or, or a foreign ministry from, from another country. It's why we have ambassadors. It's an old tool that's been used you know, now for centuries. Why? To try to bring peace and stability around the globe, to at least have someone who can talk. I always tell the story about uh, you know, our Japanese embassy, you know, right. even through all the, the Tokyo uh, bombings and the and and the uh, nuclear uh, atomic bombs that were dropped in Japan, even the Japanese, even under an emperor who they were killers, they left our embassy alone. They wanted to still have that communication with the United States so they could still have a discussion with our U.S. ambassador who was trapped in Japan, I think, for five or six years or Isn't something. Isn't that amazing? I didn't know that story. Wow. Yeah. But, but that's the, the whole irony of this, of, of yeah. General Flynn talking to the Russian ambassador is exactly what we would want an ambassador to do, that whether it's the Russian ambassador or the UK exactly. ambassador or our ambassador in a foreign country. And General Flynn, the incoming national security advisor, totally normal. And the fact that these scumbags in the media ignored all of this and tried to make something of, a, of an illegal leak of a conversation of something that was not, there was nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's just incredible. And John, I think the point you're trying to get to is every time this story started to die, they relit the fuse. They did, and often with false information. At the time the dossier was leaked, it had been entirely or mostly debunked by the FBI. Why? Because they had just interviewed Christopher Seale's primary subsource, if you believe that. And, and he said, I didn't say those things. I don't know where that came from. I was joking about that. They knew then the dossiers leaked. They knew that there's nothing on uh, Flynn. They do that. If you go back a little bit to October of 2016, 
The FBI didn't think there was a whole lot to uh, steal Dasse even then. So what do they do? They have Harry Reid go out and leak that the FBI has a big investigation going on. Time and again, when the FBI and the Justice Department and the Intelligence Committee should have put a stop and said, this is nothing here. This is a political dirty trick. They used the new me news media as willing accomplices to further a false narrative. And I think that's the biggest uh, thing. In chapter 10 of the book, in Fallout, we talk about we're entering a new age of information warfare. And sure, some of it's uh, our enemies doing it. We know that. But the new information warfare I'm most concerned about are the tactics we're using against our own people through the media, using the law enforcement, the FBI. You see constant discussion in the FBI documents that were recently declassified of leaking and meeting and talking to reporters. And we know from the stories based on those reporters, oh, they were wrong. Just last week, uh, we get Pete Strzok's notes, and they show that the, the seminal story on the front page of the New York Times, the one that sent Russia collusion into orbit, was the February, I think, 7th or 9th, uh, 2017 story that said multiple times senior Trump campaign officials met with senior government officials in Russia during the election to hijack it. And Pete Strzok goes, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. That's not even close to being true. That's not true. And, and Nine factual that, errors in a story. Well, and a lot of people that listen to this podcast, they follow the Russia hoax closely. But for those who, who are either new to the podcast or have not followed the Russia hoax, uh, Peter Strzok is one of the lovebirds. So he is that's one right. of the lead investigators within the counterintelligence division of the FBI. Uh, he's having an affair with Lisa Page, which is the deputy yeah. director of the FBI's uh, main legal counsel. They're having an affair. It's such a small group, and they're the ones that are coordinating this whole entire investigation. So the fact that you have Peter Strzok, the lead investigator, who is there saying uh, that whole story in the New York Times is fake news. I mean, he didn't use the term fake news, but essentially he might as well he said, that. But, but he, yeah, I mean, he effectively did say fake news. Yeah. And you know what's troubling? The New York Times has never retracted that story. In the heyday of journalism, when you got something wrong, you manned up, you admitted it, you issued a correction and a retraction, and you moved on. The New York Times has stubbornly refused to retract a blatantly false story. The single worst, I think, single worst story in a lot of what bad stories in the Russia collusion. It's bad for journalism. It's bad for the uh, credibility of my profession. But uh, also implicit in those notes, or not only was the institution of journalism corrupted and complicitous in this, but when you look at what Pete Strzok was saying in his own notes, there's no evidence that Carter Page, the main target, the Trump campaign advisor, who, by the way, was an American here, was helping the CIA, and here we are accusing him of being a stooge for Russia uh, back in 2017. Um, uh, throughout all of that, they were saying to the court, there is credible reason to believe that Carter Page met with Igor Dusheskin and Igor Session, two senior government and corporate officials in Russia. And Pete Strzok wrote in his notes, he didn't meet with anyone when he was working for the Trump campaign. We know that. He debunks his own uh -huh. FISA uh, warrant to the court. If you ever needed proof that, uh, that the FBI knowingly, willfully deceived the FISA court, Pete Strzok's notes you know, destroying the New York Times story is proof that he, the FBI was lying too. It's uh, it's a tragedy. Well, I know we're you know we're here discussing uh, your book, your new book, Fallout. Uh, but but because we're we're discussing uh, some of the Russia hoax issues here, John, uh, we we had just a short you and I had just a short time when this story broke on on Hannity's show um, last yeah. last week. Um, one of the things that and I and I want your opinion on this. Sure. Um, you know, we, we believe that that Steele really had no source, um, that this supposed Russian source uh, was really not a source. And of course, and now that we know from these notes, interviewed three different times, this is information that had just come out last week. Right. Um, I think Steele actually just made this source up. He picked like a real mm -hmm. Russian, but it was it's clearly somebody who had no connection. They were so far removed from the Kremlin who do we think at this point, I know we're gonna, you're going to do a lot more investigating, who is this supposed Russian that you think he's dealing with? Do you, do you, do you have an idea? I don't yet. I mean, I have a, a pool of suspects of about five or six people that I continue to win or down. But there's some really troubling evidence that has emerged, whether you look at the British case that we just talked about or the new documents that came out last week from the Senate Judiciary Committee, that maybe this source is really a composite of, of sort of rumor mongers that yeah. uh, he was uh, hearing from, and then he, he, he may have filtered them into one or two composite sources. Um, one of the things I've been told for a long time, and I've seen evidence in the documents, is that Christopher Steele, going back to 2015, there were red flags that Christopher Steele had way too many subsources for a normal intelligence asset. And that is a red flag that either he's listening to too many people that really don't are, aren't in the know, 
or he's got some manufactured personalities that he beefs out his uh, dossiers or information with. We don't know the answer to that. And the fact that we don't know the answer to that tells you just how troubling the work of Christopher Steele was. He clearly misled the FBI on many, many, many fronts. And the FBI was unwilling to stop for one second and look at the evidence in staring him in the face yeah. that Christopher Steele was full of bunk. Well, and, and look, they, they knew it, right? I mean, we know now from Strzok's notes, they, did. they knew this. So yeah. look, this is going to be more investigative work for you and the other great journalists uh, that are out there, more work for, for us to do. Hopefully right. Durham gets a long way down the road and really puts a lot of these pieces together. Uh, but let's get back uh, you know, to the book, Fallout. So kind of the last, we took a little sidebar there, but everybody yeah, else wants to hear about one, the, yeah. the latest on the Russian <laughs> hoax. But let's go into the kind of the yeah. final, kind of the third big issue in Fallout that people will want to learn about. Yeah, I think it's it, it's the uh, complicity of people around Joe Biden in the, the failure of the Russia policy and then cashing in on the Russia policy. So if you take a look at the timeline, after uh, uh, Putin co pulls the rug out from underneath uh, the Obama, Clinton, Biden team and he invades Crimea and Ukraine. And by the way, there's a it, there's a moment in the FBI investigation. They have an informant inside that's listening to the Russians for years. And they're bragging at a dinner one night after they had gotten these billions of dollars of uh, nuclear contracts, had gotten Uranium One approved, had gotten Skokovo started, the alternative Russian um, Silicon Valley. And they, they were at a dinner with the informant. The FBI is listening and, and the Russians are bragging. We cannot believe how easy it was to get all of these freebies from Barack Obama. Oh, my God, what's wrong with the guy? And they're, you know, yeah. they're throwing down vodkas and insulting our president because they felt like they had taken him to the cleaner and it wasn't even hard. Well, once Putin invades uh, Ukraine, two things happen. Uh, uh, Biden gets named to be the point man to stabilize or buck up uh, Ukraine. And he goes in April of 2014 and he gives a speech uh, in, with the Ukrainian prime ministry. He says, you know what we're going to do to make Ukraine independent? We're going to uh, create a natural gas uh, capability here so you don't have to buy Russian gas. Once you're off Russian gas, they have less leverage on you. And not two weeks later, not two weeks later, Hunter Biden just miraculously lands on the board of the one of the largest natural gas companies in Ukraine. It wasn't an accident. Yeah. But that's not the only enrichment scheme related to Russian uranium. Uh, around the same time, you see a close Biden advisor, a guy named Amos Hotstein, start going before Congress on television. He's saying, we it's it's sinful, it's immoral, it's wrong to let Russia have any energy monopolies because they use it as a geopolitical weapon to, to weaken the world. Well, if you go back just a few years before those very fine comments by Mr. Hotstein, you'll find out, and we have all the records are up on Just the News on the site, for years, he was advising Rosatom, the Russian nuclear empire, and making lots of money doing so on how they can get a leg up in the American market, essentially create a monopolized market for Russia here in the United States. And that would ultimately you know, make uh, put the U U.S. uranium business out of business and Russia would have a codependency on America. Amos Hotstein got paid to do that. He certainly didn't mention that when he was, uh, I'm sorry, Hotstein didn't uh, mention that when he was uh, giving those speeches and, and railing against Russia. He was for Russia before he's against Russia. Yeah. Well, you know, the other funny thing, John, is we you, you talk about why did the Clinton campaign want to inoculate themselves and try to accuse Trump of doing something with Russia. The irony is, is that it's really, it was Biden the whole time that how these issues with Ukraine. Now, you know, when that whole impeachment hoax was going on that, you know, said, you know, supposedly Trump was, you know, doing a favor with the Ukrainian president, the whole thing was a joke, just the continuation nice. of the Russia hoax. Uh, that you know embroiled this country into a, a, a shameful, ep another shameful episode. As if the whole Russia hoax wasn't enough, if the Mueller uh, witch hunt team wasn't enough, you know, then they come back and they make up a, a out a whole cloth a Ukrainian hoax story just to continue this. If all of that wasn't enough, the irony is it's it's Biden. Biden's the one that has all the connections, and his son that has all these connections to Ukraine. Um, now, look, and, and looking back at the time during the impeachment hoax, I mean, Biden was roadkill. Um, everybody knew that the guy that were, he was having some some issues, you know, able, you know, communicating. Uh, right. He was left for dead until essentially the Democratic Party machine uh, panicked and said, oh, my gosh, we're going to end up with Bernie Sanders here. And that's that when they went and got moment. all the other candidates out of the race. You yeah. know, they were hoping Bloomberg's uh, billion dollars would would save him when that didn't work. They had to get all the candidates out of the, the race, Mayor Pete and Klobuchar and all these, you know, supposedly rising stars in the Democratic Party. 
so they could prop Biden up just enough so he could squeeze by Sanders uh, in this primary. So, you know, clearly they have a Ukraine problem. And I think you're, you know, this is obviously in your book, Fallout, um, which, you know, exactly. as I said, I think it's going to be a, uh, we, we'll be able to make, you'll be able to make a movie out of this. It should be a James, you need a giant James Bond character in it. There you go. We have one in, uh, in Doug Campbell, the undercover informant, an American, amazing American hero. Let me just say something. One thing, Congressman, because in the book, one of the things that became absolutely apparent was the attacks on you in 2017 and 2018. You go back now and you look at the Adam Schiff memo written to counter your, your official investigation. Adam Schiff was either lying or completely incompetent and couldn't see the evidence standing before him. But the attacks on you are, uh, you have been vindicated by the evidence that's come forward, but you'll never hear that from the mainstream media. But you told the truth to us in the beginning. And as a reporter who values truth, we, we're deeply grateful that you did that. Well, John, and I am deeply grateful for uh, you and all the other, uh, uh, the very few investigative reporters yeah. that are out there. So, John, congratulations on your book, Thank you, sir. Fallout. I hope that uh, everybody will go out and, and buy it and read it uh, before this election. You'll learn, you'll learn a lot. And of course, there's always Just the News website. This is Devin Nunes. I want to thank John Solomon for being here. We'll catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Devin Nunes podcast. We invite you to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And remember, you can download this podcast on iTunes or at DevinNunes.com. Storm clouds been gathering so long, I don't know. The darkness around us leaves no easy road. We started wondering if every road dead ends our dreams. It whips the dust up and rains pouring down. Good people struggling in every hometown. We started wondering if we even matter. by fire like this It's nothing hard working family can fix We've got the power to save it all here in our hands We'll take that hard road to happier days Cause we kept our American faith Paid for by Devin Nunes Campaign Committee.